You are listening to the Co-Movement Gym Podcast. The following is a conversation with Andrew Sipley. Today, Andy and I are going to discuss a basic training program for beginners looking at completing the 15K and also a program for those looking at completing their first 50K. We are also going to chat about nutrition and race strategies. I would like to thank our sponsors, Native Path Supplements, Lombardi Chiropractic, Home Sweet Home Cleaning, and Thin Line Martial Arts. If you are enjoying this content, I ask that you support these companies in the description and take advantage of the enticing discount they're providing our listeners by using code COMO15, that's C-O-M-O-15. I thank each and every one of you for being on this journey with us. Now, please enjoy the show. We got Andy and I back in the studio. How you doing, buddy? Great. Back for another episode. Yeah, this is sort of like a part two to the Brookfield Classic. We wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, and we've had these questions from people. I just got a call today from someone um, on training plans, getting ready for the 15K or 50K. Yeah, because this is going to be probably the first time that some people do a 15K or an ultra marathon of 50K. Yeah, and training is obviously pivotal. This is very, very important. You're not going to yeah. just go off the couch and do 50 kilometers. Yeah. No, I, I would say almost no one would do that, right. you know, unless you're coming from some collegiate background and something, but so training plan is huge nutrition. We're talking about a little bit. Um, so you don't bonk as well as, um, like race day strategy. And yeah. yep. We'll just give a few tips on that. Um, and then maybe just some overall strategy as far as like prep and recovery, you know, yeah. um, because both these distances, especially the 50 K, um, unless you're super seasoned at this, you know, if you're new, like I am, it's, uh, there's a lot to learn. Like I'm amazed in the last six months, how much I've learned. Yeah. You've been diving into it. <laughs> I love it. Just cause I like decoding things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I find it fascinating, like the zones and the fueling and there's just a lot to it yeah. and I'm not remotely competitive or don't care to be, but it's still like interesting it's still interesting for sure yeah mm -hmm. so all right let's start off with 15k example someone's maybe a casual 5k road runner um beginner to intermediate fitness level and they're considering a 15k yep. Brookfield maybe they've never done a 15k they've done some walking and hiking they've done maybe some 5ks or something yes and they want to do the 15k at Bro Brookfield okay yeah so where would you start that person we are when this launches this particular one we're going to be probably beginning of July they're going to be hearing this because we're shooting this July, August weeks before. So they've got about 10 weeks before the race then. Which is a good block. That, that, that's a good amount of time to get ready for a 15K, your yes. first 15K if you just want to finish. Yep. yep. That, that's enough time to, to get you ready. So where does this person start? What do you think? I know, and this is general, obviously, Andy or I, especially Andy, could we could write a detailed program based on the individual. Definitely, well, this yeah. Is generic 50,000 foot view. Yep, yep. And they just want to be able to finish comfortably their first 15K. Yep. Um, well, we'd want to get their, we'd want to get them running regularly. Um, the, I would say the frequency you'd want to be running probably three days a week, mm -hmm. um, if not four or five, okay. you know? Um, and we wanna get your mileage up to, let's see, you wanna, you wanna be able to complete nine miles in September. And right now you can do maybe three, four miles, something like that. Correct. So, okay, so this is great because you've got the ability to increase then about half a mile a week mm -hmm. and get up to the point where September 1st, you're doing like maybe seven miles or so, seven, eight miles. So at that point, you've done enough that you can make the nine miles um, for the Brookfield Classic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so for that person, I, I think the way that I would do it would probably be try to run, let's say three, four, or if you're up for it, maybe five days a week, but three or four days a week would be great. And make one of those days your longer run. So every single week you do a long run. Mm -hmm which is just your longest run of the week. And in the beginning, maybe that's a, maybe it's a three mile run. And every week, just try to increase that by half a mile. So the next week is three and a half, then it's four, then it's four and a half, then it's five, then it's five. So, so this is Mondays, Monday long run. Yeah, whatever day a week works yep, for you yep, best. Yep, sure. yep. So you, maybe it's your Monday long run. So every Monday you're gonna do your long run and try to increase that by about half a mile each week. Okay. And if you're starting it, three or four miles, then it's only going to take, um, 
eight weeks and you'd be up to and that's perfect because then they get up to eight miles. They can deload for the next two. Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. And so typically before an event like this, you don't want to train right up until the event because the training takes a little bit out of you physically. So you want to do what's known as a taper week, the, the week before, or maybe two weeks before, if you're doing the ultra, mm -hmm. um, which is where you reduce your mileage and you, you allow your body to heal so that on race day, you're nice and fully recovered and feeling fresh mm -hmm. and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So I would say for this person, if they're starting training in the first week of July, they've got eight weeks, July and August, to kind of build up their mileage, build up that long run to uh -huh. hopefully around like seven or eight miles, maybe even nine if they can get there. Um, and then like the the week or two before the race, you back off significantly, cut your training in half um, and just uh, you know come in feeling nice and fresh and recovered. All right, I really like that. So Mon but we're just giving this as a hypothetical. Monday is your big day, and you're going starting at three, increasing a half mile. Yep. So, um, next, so next Monday would be three and, three and a half. half. So next yep. Monday would be four. Next Monday would be four and a half. Yep. Yep. All the way up until my week eight, and then taper for the last week or two. Yeah. Okay. Yep. yep. And then how about Wednesday, day two? What's yep. that look like? So the, the other two days, I would do um, just a shorter distance. If you're doing the 15K, then let's say the other two days could be half of your long run distance up to maybe three quarters of it. Okay. So like, let's say, let's say you're somewhere in the middle, you're, you're, you're in August right now and your long run is six miles this week on Monday. Then your Wednesday and Friday runs would be like three or three and a half or four, something like that. Okay. So 50% to 70% volume yeah. on a Wednesday and Friday yeah, something of like your, that. based off of your Monday, a big day. Yep. yep. All right. That's great. I had no idea. The, the, okay. long, the long run is the most important thing. That's, that's the thing where you're building up your endurance so you can mm -hmm. make it through the whole event. But if you're only doing that long run every week and nothing mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. um, it's going to become really taxing. Those shorter runs in the middle of the week kind of help build up more tissue tolerance, get your joints and muscles used yes. to the pounding, get your feet used to it. Um, and they, they continue to provide the adaptations that, that you need to support your long runs. Mm -hmm. So it's really the long run is your bread and butter. Um, but those shorter runs throughout the week, whether you're doing two more short runs or three more short runs throughout the week, um, those kind of just, uh, get your body prepared for the long run, which is the, the important training run for the week. Yeah, because you're not going to want to run one day a week. It's just not going to be enough adaptation. Right. right, definitely not. One thing I want to add in is the zone one. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about that. Zone one generally is, um, how would we define that for people? Like uh, 140 or under heart rate well, or the ability to talk easily? So, so the, the zone nomenclature is, is kind of wishy-washy because people mm -hmm. use it in different ways. Sure. Typically, the way that I have seen it used and the way that I use it is um, zone one is you're walking. Um, so that's, that's really low heart rate. That's very easy. Okay. Um, if someone just goes for a walk, you know, uh, that that's zone one. Okay. Zone two is where your training should be. Okay. And zone, okay. two, zone two is like you're running, but at a very, uh, at a slow pace where you can maintain a conversation. Yeah. That's important. So, so the best way to think of zone two is like, um, you can, you can maintain a conversation with someone if you're running with them or, you can breathe through your nose. You don't mm -hmm. have to. Um, you don't have to take breaths through your mouth. If you can maintain nasal breathing, then you're probably in zone two. Okay. Um, yeah. Or if you're going by heart rate, which is the best thing to do, um, then roughly like a, maybe a one thirty to one forty heart rate. Sure. For most people, something like that. Okay, and that's going to be a lot slower. Than, than most people think. Yeah. So for example, for me, for example, I love. You know, I can run a mile in. I don't know, maybe like five minutes and 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, if I run a 15, or I'm sorry, if I run a, uh, a 5K road race, I can probably hold like a six minute mile or something like that. Yep. Um, and I'm very comfortable running seven and eight minute miles. Mm -hmm. But for me, if I'm training in zone two, which is where the vast majority of your training should be for endurance stuff, um, I'm running at like a 10 to 11 minute mile. Yeah. So a lot slower than you than you might be used to.
or it might think. That's, I want people to really listen to that. That is, um, look at the difference in pace. Like you could run a seven to eight minute mile for a long time. Yep. yep. And your, your zone two base training mm -hmm. is at a 10 to an 11. Mine is like, yeah, 1030 to 13 based on mm -hmm. terrain and whatever. Yep. Um, but yeah, I would say probably on average, like 1115 is yeah. where I am for that zone. Sure. And I can go a long ways um, and the heart rate's really low and I can talk like yep. what we were, when we yep. ran one mile on that course with you the other weekend, I was, that was zone one. And we were having two. a conversation the whole way. Exactly. Yep. Um, yeah, that's going to be really, really important for people. Yeah. And an important thing to remember here too, is sometimes when people go for shorter runs, they think, oh, this run is shorter so I can run it faster. Like, let's say your long run for the week is maybe six miles and you're like, okay, so I'm going to do this in zone two at a 12 minute mile pace, right? Where I can maintain the conversation, nasal breathe, whatever. But then they're on their Wednesday or Friday run or whatever. And they say, okay, well, this run is only three miles. So this one I can speed up and do it a uh, nine minute mile pace. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Like you should do, you, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, what they call build your aerobic base. We're trying to, to um, improve your, your aerobic system, which is what's going to carry you through these long races. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is by training in that zone two at that mm -hmm. slow pace so even when you're running a shorter training run, like three miles or something, you should still be doing that at like an 11 minute mile, even though you could go much faster because it's a shorter run. And the reason we're doing this is because if you take, let's say you're a two hour 15K mm -hmm. for Brookfield Classic, yep. uh, the I would say up until the last half mile, you're going to be in that zone one, zone two, right? Yeah. Like, so that's the energy system you have to train you yeah. know to, to get better at power or increasing your one mile or two mile prepping for a 15k like this i think you're smarter to go lower heart rate definitely yeah, yeah that, that's yeah that's the foundation that you need now the competitive runners sure. if, if they're trying to race the 15k brookfield class sure, sure then of course they're, they're going to do other things they're going to add in speed work and vo2 max work and things like that yep but they they put all of that on top of their their aerobic base. They they still do a ton of zone two training. That person already has the aerobic right. base. Yep. And they've done other races and whatnot. But um yeah, I would say that that person, yeah, they're definitely doing some. If different this things. is your first time doing a 15K and you just want to finish with a smile on your face, yep. do all of your training in zone two. Yep. Just build up that aerobic system as best you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make you, that's going to make you well prepared for the race and allow you to finish comfortably. Yeah. Uh, that's a good, that's a good breakdown. Anything else for that person for 15 K before we get into 50 K? Um, no, except I would say, um, maybe they're, they're wondering about, um, like what kind of fuel they would need out there or something like that. And the good news with a 15 K is that it's a short enough race that you don't really have to worry too much about fueling during it. Yep. So if you are trying to do the, the 15 K fun run hike, um, I would say bring some snacks just to enjoy while you're out there. Sure. Um, but it's not going to be crucial. You're not going to like hit a wall. Like some people do when they're racing a competitive marathon or yep. something. Yep. Um, you're probably not going to find yourself, uh, overly dehydrated. Just drink at the aid station. Especially in stuff. September. You yeah, know, September, you're not going to have a 90 degree day. Yeah, most likely. So really, the, the main thing for that person to focus on to just complete their first 15K is run a few times a week, three, four, something like that. Get in that long run and just make sure all of your runs are in that nice, easy, comfortable zone to mm -hmm. build mm -hmm. up that aerobic base mm -hmm. and you should be all set. Awesome. I like mm -hmm. it. Uh, 50K um, newbie, right? So... Because we do have a few people already that are going to do oh, yeah. 50K and it's going to be their first ultra marathon. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, and I haven't done that myself. I'm hoping to complete that sooner than later. You know, yeah. it'll probably be August. Maybe I'll give it a go. So I'm sort of on that journey-ish. I'm not on a formal training plan, but right. I'm... Well, you're training for triathlons. And yeah, stuff, so, so I'm... Yeah, there's a you're lot. You're mixing in a lot of other things. <laughs> Exactly, which is helping the, aer the mm -hmm. aerobic base, but the conditioning for running muscles, I'm not benefiting. I need to be running, like you said, three to four days a week, and I'm running one to two, one being longer for mm -hmm. sure, and then that second one 
being more of like a fast 5k like a brick mm -hmm. coming off a bike or something yeah, yeah um but i'm not really prepping for the ultra but for someone that wants to focus on that for the next eight to ten weeks what does that look like because you give a great very simple breakdown for that 15k what would it look like for the 50k yeah the 15k or the, the 50k if you're trying to do this ultra marathon that's going to take a little more prep that person is it's going to be structured fairly similarly where they're still going to have one long run a week that's okay. going to be their bread and butter okay like that's the most important thing and the 50k that's 31 miles they're going to want to make sure that they get their long run hopefully up to about 20 miles oh um, 20 all right no higher than that no nah, yeah I wouldn't, I wouldn't go higher than okay. that yep. especially with 10 weeks yeah, yeah by the time they're listening to right this. hopefully it, it, hopefully you're training before that. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe not you know. yep yep so you you want to get that that long run up to um 18 to 20 miles if you can hit the 20 mile mark then you're you should be in pretty good shape to because after your taper you'll be nice and fresh and you'll be able to go a little further than you think sure and uh, in the whole race day vibes type thing. Exactly. Yeah. That, that'll okay. carry you a long way. Sure. Um, so in your training, if you can get that last long run up to about 20 miles in your peak week, okay. that would be perfect. Okay. But this person would want to have a little more volume throughout the week too. Mm -hmm. So instead of just running three days a week, um, they'd probably want to be running, I would say, five would wow. be ideal. Okay. Um, sure. You know, and, and that can vary. Some people will do four days a week. Some people might do five, some people might do six. Mm -hmm. You know, I did six in training for my recent race, but um, if you can do four to five days a week, five would be great. Um, for this person, you've got your one long run every week. And I don't know where the person is starting like in, in July, what their current long run is, but you're aiming to get that long run up to about 20 miles mm -hmm. if you can before the race comes. You also have a second long run somewhere in the week. Okay. And, and the second long run, I like to make about 75% of the distance of my long run. Okay. So let's start out with like, uh, they listen to this, they've got 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, they are currently able to do a 10 K comf comfortably. Mm -hmm. They're not yep. sprinting it. So, maybe, um, so six, so, six so, point two. So if this person has 10 weeks to train. Yep. Let's say they're, they're starting off where their long run is 10 miles. Yep. That's great. They have 10 weeks. They can increase their long run by one mile every week. Okay. So second sure. week, it's an 11 mile long run. Next week, it's a 12. Next week, it's a 13. And then, you know, they get up to 20 miles. Or 18. Or 18. Load right, exactly. The last two weeks. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, but their second long run should be about 75% of the distance of their first one. Okay. So maybe in your first week, if your long run is 10 miles, yep. your, your second long run is maybe like seven, seven and a half, something like that. And the, yes. Or wow. seven miles. And then later on in the training, when they're maybe in their peak week, when their long run is 18 miles, mm -hmm. their second long run is 14. Yes. Or 13 or something 70%. like that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So that, when would you put that set the 70% day in? Like a Thursday? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I, like, I like to spread them out. Like, um, so if their long run is on Monday, then maybe their second long run is on Thursday. Okay. So Monday, Thursday, we have done. That's great. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't those, any of So this. those are the two most important runs you're going to do. Okay. Um, and then the other, let's say they're let's running, say three, like, four days a week. Let's, say let's do four. This, this yeah. is the ultra runner. So they're, they're trying to do the, the, the 50 kilometer. Yep. So we're saying they're doing four days a week. Yep. So you got your long run one, your, your second long run, which is 75% of that distance on Thursday. And then your other two runs throughout the week should maybe be about half the distance of your long run or maybe even a little less. Okay, so let's say 40%. So yeah. week one, Monday was 10 miles. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuesday would be four. Usually what I like to do, you might want to take the day off after your long run. Okay. Because the, the long run tends to be the most stressful because you're going, you're mm -hmm. pushing to further distances than you've ever been before. Sure. So maybe the next day is a rest day. Okay. So then maybe uh, Wednesday, you go for, let's see, what, what do we say? Monday is a 10 mile long run. Yep. And Thursday was 75%, 70%. So seven miles. Yep. yep. So then maybe like a, on Wednesday, Wednesday and Saturday, okay. you're doing a 40%. Yeah. You're doing like a four mile run. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So Monday, 10, Wednesday, four, Thursday, seven, Friday, rest, Saturday, four, Sunday, rest. Yeah. 
and that would be week one, yep, and, and that, then increase the big day one mile per week for eight weeks, yep. and then adjust the 70, 75% percentage and the 40% percentage accordingly. Yeah, the, okay. the, the, wow. the, the second long run, I would only be going up like maybe half a mile a week, something mm -hmm. like that. And then the, uh, the two short runs, um, maybe every couple weeks, you go up like half a mile or okay. so on you're basing it off the percentage, percentage. Too, if you really yeah. want to make it simple, but sure, it's not going to be nearly as much of an increase right. because it's such a small percent. Exactly. I can point four miles more on the easier days yeah. on average. So, yep. wow, that's great, man. You are really good at breaking that down. And so, you no don't, idea. and so once again, like you, we're not doing any speed work here. We're not doing any, you're never going mm -hmm. fast. All these runs are being done at, you know, that, below 140 heart rate conversational pace whatever that is for you it's gonna be different for everybody but for me i mean all these runs would be like um 11 minute miles yep. something like that yep. you know yep. it's gonna be different for everybody okay all right um so let's talk about nutrition for the 50k because this is a different beast is this um nutrition like during your training or is this nutrition during the race well um yeah well let's say race but then we would want them to play around with it during training yeah yeah, yeah so they would know but like let's talk about like race day you know mm -hmm. um what are uh, just some basic recommendations for sure. intake whether it's water sugar calories stuff yep. like that so you're going to be out there for let's see probably how long are we going to be out there on this thing it's going to be well six to nine hours six yeah it's going to be at least hauling ass like at least two hours per lap yep. if you're really fast yeah and an uh, average i think that would, that would be fast yeah yeah and so, so now like if you're coming at it from a background of this and i think you can go sub six for sure oh, yeah yeah um but i'm saying the the person where let's say me um i won't do six hours yeah you can go there like, like seven, seven or eight. and a half to eight yeah okay. mm -hmm. So I would be looking at, um, as far as hydration goes, first of all, you definitely want to be taking the water. You know, we're going to be sweating out there and getting dehydrated a little bit is, <laughs> getting dehydrated is going to be a major issue. So you don't want to have that happen. Um, you can consume about, uh, let me think, it's going to be probably about 24 ounces per hour, I believe, of water. Um, now, most people are probably not gonna need that much because it's not gonna be a hot day. 24 so, hours per, yeah, okay, sure. When it comes to um, hydrating, it depends a lot on the conditions. If you're running in 80 degree weather versus we're gonna hold this in September, it might be a 50 degree mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. um, it depends a lot on how much you sweat. So um, just make sure that you're being proactive with drinking water at every aid station, sipping on water along the way. Um, I would say you, you want to probably make sure you're taking at least 12 ounces per hour. Yeah, I was going to say 16 to 24, like yeah. 12 to 24. Yeah, you yeah. Are, yeah. 12 every, ounces every per hour will probably keep you okay if you're not sweating much. Okay. But most likely you will be sweating, um, in which case... Yeah, sixteen to twenty-four, like you said, seems okay. about right. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, that's that's great formula. Um, yeah, don't do what I did. I did twenty ounces in two and a half hours. Yeah, right. It was just bad. I stopped the day when you were sweating. Yeah, it was like uh, seventy-seven. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's not right, but I like that formula. How about for um, like sugar or calories? Yeah. So when it comes to the nutrition, um, you can consume about. 250 calories per hour okay um and you, carbohydrates are probably the thing you want to focus on the most mm -hmm. easily digestible carbs like sugars mm -hmm. um about 75 grams of carbs per hour okay um, 70 to 75 yeah wow. 60 to 60 to 80 something okay. like that yeah um so the way that i like to do that is take in about I think of it in terms of calories, but um, like maybe like eighty to hundred calories every twenty minutes or so. Okay. Um, this can be different for everybody. You know, mm -hmm. you might take in like a hundred calories every half an hour or something like that. Okay. Um, but but you want to kind of keep a slow, steady drip throughout the whole race. You know, you don't want to wait until you're hungry and then 
try to shovel down a bunch of food when it's too late. What are you recommending, like for examples, um, for fuel? So, so easily digestible carbohydrates. So I like things like um, fruit snacks, you know, which are just simple sugar, mm -hmm. easy to get into your bloodstream. Some people like liquid calories, like a Powerade, Gatorade, something like that. Okay. You know, sports drinks. Yep. Um, some people like something like a granola bar or a cliff bar, a Laura bar, Lara bar, things like Mac that. Macro macro. Um, bananas are often really great. They're easy mm -hmm. to digest. Um, or oranges, oranges, yeah, things like I that. Like oranges. Yep. So, so we're talking about like simple sugars like that. Um, and we're going to have some things like that at aid stations. I, I hope to have, um, uh, fruit snacks and bananas for sure available at aid stations. Yep. And honestly, for me, like that would be enough to get me through just fine. Okay. Um, but okay. if people wanted to carry with them like granola bars or a cliff bar mm -hmm. or something, something a little more substantial, sometimes solid food feels really nice out there. Okay. Um, when you're doing these long events, you never know what your stomach is going to want. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it can kind of, it, it's funny how much you're, your cravings and what your stomach can handle changes and shifts throughout mm -hmm. these events. So you might be doing great on fruit snacks for your first lap. And then after that, like all of a sudden the thought of eating another fruit snack is like just disgusting to you and you want something salty or you want something crunchy or you want something solid. Um, so you want to have a little bit of a variety. I, I think it's a good idea to have uh, maybe a couple backup items, like, like I said, like a couple, cliff bars or something that you've eaten before a granola bar that you know you like um as an option for if the aid station food isn't like feeling good to you at that time <laughs> sure 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 okay yeah Th yeah those are good um we were just talking before this call about like maple syrup mm -hmm. yeah, yeah um lionel sanders a triathlete um uses that maple syrup and water and then th i guess you got to add salt too for a to top it digest the right way but I'd recommend just people look into that on their yep. own or experiment with it. Uh, there's a company called Untapped that uh, sells these maple syrup endurance products. Mm -hmm. um, we love Redmond Relight. I and I used Redmond Relight in this past ultra marathon that I did. Awesome, and it helped me a well, lot. I, I did. I I was really happy with my performance, and I felt really good the whole way. And I really think that the Redmond helped me a lot. Sure. Um, I know how much salt I was losing because you can see when you sweat, you know, I, I could see my shirt and I could see like the white crystals of okay. like sodium that I was losing sure. on my shirt, you know? Yeah. Um, so I had some Redmond Relight before my race. I had it um, every time that I went through a certain aid station. So that was uh, three times during my race. Okay. Um, and we're going to have Redmond Relight at the aid stations for people yep. to like, um, what that, what that formula is, is, uh, it supplies you with electrolytes, the most important one being sodium, but also mm -hmm. potassium and magnesium and chloride mm -hmm. and other electrolytes that you lose when you're sweating. Mm -hmm. And loss of electrolytes, especially sodium, can really cause you to crash in an endurance event. Sure. So we're going to make sure that people have access to, to sodium when they're out there mm -hmm. in the form mm -hmm. of this relight, yes. which, I mean, worked phenomenally for me. Yes. It, it tastes great, and I really looked forward to it every time I had it. What did you bring? The, um the packets or what did you want? Nope. I had a, a drop bag at one of the aid stations. Yep. I had a canister of relight yep. and then I had um, an empty water bottle that I kept in my drop bag. Sure. And so every time that I went to that aid station, I put a scoop of relight into my water Just bottle. One scoop? One scoop, okay. shook it up, drank it. Yep. But I did that three times throughout the race. So you took in 3,000 milligrams of sodium. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I was, losing, all I was losing a lot of sodium. So that sure. was great to replenish. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So those are the three big topics. Um, amount of water, mm -hmm. which is saying 12 to 24 ounces per hour. And that's going to totally depend on like how hot it is on that day and sure. how much you're sweating. But everyone will need some water, at least 12 ounces per hour. Yep. And if you're sweating, it's probably going to be more than that, 16 to 20 to maybe even 24 if it's a hot day and you're pushing hard. Sure. Yep. Yeah. I was taking it for this ultra marathon that I just did. I was drinking, I had two water bottles with me that were 12 ounces each. Mm -hmm. And I was um, finishing both of those every single hour. You were? Okay. So I was taking sure. 24 ounces of water per hour. Plus, when I stopped at aid stations, I would often have a drink of like 
whatever they had there or my sure. free light or whatever. Yep. What yep. was the temperature of that day? 72, 75? Yeah, like, like mid 70s. Mid 70s, yeah. yeah. You guys were sweating. Uh, I was, yeah, I was sweating a lot. Yeah. <laughs> So that would be one water um, amounts. Number two would be electrolytes, playing around with that, relight, maple syrup, um, tailwind, right? Like and lots have, of different options. We have coupon codes for relight. We'll make sure to throw the, the, the yeah. sponsor ad on this episode. Yeah, um, that's a great point. It's too. such a phenomenal product. I relight is my favorite electrolyte supplement. Um, it tastes really good. It gives you a high concentration of all the electrolytes you need, including a bunch of like trace minerals and stuff. Like, yes. it's really good stuff. Yes, I drink, it as well. I, I drink it daily. It's super refreshing. Yes. Yeah. And it's not that expensive. Um, with our code uh, COMO15, C-O-M-O-15, if you type that in as a coupon code, I think it's like 15% off. Yeah. And they might get free shipping. Um, so if you go to redmond.life, that will take you to where you need to go. Perfect. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's great. And then the, the last part is sugar and calories, right? You said 250 calories ish per hour. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. Yeah. That's and, your, and yeah. That, by the way, this stuff, the, the fueling during your run, this is something that you want to practice in yep. your training. Yep. And um, I like to practice it on my long runs. So we already said like you're doing a long run every week and then you got your second long run and then your two shorter runs, right? Yeah. I practice my fueling strategies on my one longest run of the week. Um, the other runs that I do, I, I typically only drink water, but on my one long run, I'm always practicing like eating some fruit snacks or um, like trying like a bar or like just trying some of the foods that I think I might eat during the race, yep. just to make sure that my stomach can handle those things while I'm running. Sure. You don't want to be out there on race day and eat like a, a, a granola bar that you've never had during training yep. and all of a sudden find out that it doesn't sit well in your stomach. That was me when I did that, the 12 miles. Oh, and you I tried Lara bars, Two right? of them. Yeah. And um, the dates, like it just sat in the bottom of my stomach yep. and it felt like not good. So see, and you know, I wasn't processing so that, that was right. Perfect experience for you because that was not a race day for you. That was just a training day. Yes. And you experimented with Lara bars on your training day and found out that, oh, this is something that does not agree with me. So mm -hmm. now you would not make the mistake of bringing that to the Brookfield Classic. For sure. Yeah. yeah. It's like rehearsal, like over yeah, and over exactly. and over. Next yep. time I'm going to try um, 24 ounces of water with three tablespoons of maple syrup and one scoop of Relight. Yeah. That's going to be the next combo I so try. What I would tell people is if you're listening to this, you've got 10 weeks to prepare. Mm -hmm. You've got 10 long runs to try all sorts of different things. Yep. You can try fruit snacks. You can try goo packets. You can try mm -hmm. um, a sports drink. You can try like every single long run. You can try different things and find what feels best to you when you're mm -hmm. running. Yes, yep. sir what you enjoy eating when you're out there. Yeah, that's a big part too. Yeah, you know, you, the, yeah. the Laura bars, um, right from the start, it was like dry and like, I like them occasionally, the mm -hmm. right settings, but that did not work for yep. that for me. I don't think I would like those on a run either. No, no. it was because they got nuts in them and stuff. It's hard yeah. to digest and there's- um, So that's actually, it's funny you just said that. Um, when we were looking for uh, snacks that I could bring on this ultra marathon that I just did, um, I, I, I told my girlfriend that, uh, um, I wanted to avoid things with nuts in them. Mm -hmm. Like that's for sure. They, they're just, they take long to digest. Sometimes they can upset your stomach. Um, so I, you know, I opt for things with more like simple sugars and even, even the fruit snacks that I had, had, um, like corn syrup in them, which typically I don't eat sure. ever in my life, but like, but you're burning like 8,000 calories. That's a simple, very easy to digest carbohydrate that won't upset your stomach, you know? So on race day, like, that's a, a fuel that can work. Yeah, the simpler the better. And like fruit we would have there also. So if they wanted to take care of like the electrolytes, their water, uh, we'll wear water also, yep. but you're probably carrying it. And, um, you know, some easy snacks, like if you want fruit, you yeah. know, you could have the fruit too. Yeah, I, I found that um, bananas were awesome. Yeah. Because um, they had those at every aid station and they, they, they chopped the bananas in half so you could take a half a banana with you. Yeah. And every time I left an aid station, I would leave with like half a banana in my hand yeah. and just kind of munch that as That's I was awesome. running away. That's awesome. That was great. Yeah. Um, I'll also say that uh, me personally, I love uh, coconut water. 
yeah. and you met me out on the trail and gave me a a, a liter of coconut yeah, water. Yes, he brought it. Yep. Yeah, and then yep. I caught up with you, and yeah, you you pounded what? Um, geez, I had drank almost know. the whole thing in like, like twenty or thirty ounces. It was I amazing. Mean, it, it was so and, refreshing. And actually, I'll vouch for that too. Um, normally, summertime, I drink a lot of coconut water when mm -hmm. I'm exercising or do something hard. It is like the biggest boost in in just alertness and energy. So refreshing. There's something about that. There's a ton of potassium in it. It's, it's, what it's it got is? more potassium than a banana. Okay. It's also got the simple sugars. It's got vitamin C. Yeah. The coconut water. That's a good, yeah, that's another, that's what I'm going to try also, coconut water. I'm yeah. going to do the one combo I said, and then coconut water. I'm going to try that. Because uh, if I do an Olympic distance triathlon, that's going to be close to four hours for mm -hmm. me because I'm slow. And I'm going to have to fuel um, probably four or five times for that. And yeah. so I'll have to like after the swim, do something. And yeah, so I'm going to play with that too, coconut water. Um, all right, so that's nutrition. Last thing, strategies. So one thing I want to talk about real quick is, and I'm playing around with this, um, on a course like this with almost 5,000 feet of elevation gain, I am power hiking mm -hmm. a lot of the hills. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting into that anaerobic shit stage where my heart rate's 180 because yeah, I want to make let's, up let's time. Let's that right now. Okay. Like we, we're doing all of our training in that zone two state and your race day should be in that same state. Correct. It's very easy on race day to get excited because you're at the event and oh my gosh, oh my good, like it, and the, the gun goes off and yep. the adrenaline's going and we're here, we're doing it and you take off too fast yep. and that can really destroy you like you you want to make sure that that same zone two that you trained in that conversational heart rate um you want to be running your ultra marathon at that same pace yes yep. don't go too fast yes correct. and that means like you said when you get to an uphill going uphill really raises your heart rate it's so much more work so we definitely recommend walking the uphills, especially the steep ones, but even like gradual uphills. Yeah. Don't feel bad about walking. Walking an uphill on the first lap can make the last lap a lot easier. And I learned that because the, the first time I did the loop, it was uh, my ego was like, dude, just rip up this thing, yeah, you know, like yeah. CrossFit style. And on the first it, lap, you can. Yes. And it, it'll destroy you. I yeah. promise you long term. Um, so you don't, Power want, you don't want to put yourself into a hole no. that you have to dig your way out of. Yeah. No. And then depending on the downhills, some people run them and you can make up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Depends on the footing, mm -hmm. right? Because I will power hike down some of them depending on the footing, right? Yep. You don't want to roll your ankle or whatever, uh, but you can make up some time there sometimes. But the flats, you have to, and it depends on who you are and your strategy, but I have found that that those are my three um, strategies. I power hike the hill, I'll run the down and then, or power hike down depending on the condition. But when I hit a flat, I'm opening it up. And it's, uh, and on this course, it's a perfect balance of that. Like yeah. there's probably 40% flat where you can, if you were a seven minute miler and you want to go like, and that's a Z2, Z3, and you want to make up a little time and not mm -hmm. kill yourself, yep. open it up. Like I was opening it up like to an 830 pace, mm -hmm. but the my course average so far is about a 1330 yeah, overall. The, up, the uphills slow you down. So yeah, and, in some, and there's one or two downhill sections where I'm moving slow too. You have to walk, yeah. Um, but, make up time where you can without going too far. Yeah. You know? yeah. You're going to let the terrain dictate your pace on a lot of this. Um, yes. Yep. Uh, so some people go into these things thinking that they can strategize. I think I actually, I heard you say something like this when you were on the podcast with Bob a few weeks ago um, where you were like, Oh, maybe, you know, what, what would your, what would your strategy be? Should you like run for five minutes, walk for one minute, run for five minutes. Yeah. And you, you can't think no. of it that way because yeah. it's it's going to be the terrain that dictates your pace and how you're feeling. So yeah. where I got that originally from was me running on the towpath. Okay, yeah, yeah. Which is, which is dead, dead, dead. So you can just go by a timer. And yeah. that's what I was doing. I was yeah. like doing a four minute run and then a one minute walk. That was a cycle. And I'll still do it when I do that, you know, the the flat stuff. But you're right. You can't go based on a timer for a race like this because the train is changing constantly, yep, yep, you know? So, yep. uh, but yeah, it's important to stay in that zone one, two, you know, area. So totally. Yep. 
any strategies for you or what do you got for people? I think we filled a ton of content with the, with this. So no, I think, I think that's pretty much all anyone really needs to Good. know to a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff in there. So yep. Yep. re listen to it or share it with friends. But the, the big thing is going to be, um, you, your success is going to be determined by how prepared you are. So it's, you know, get in those four runs a week, get your long run up to 18 or yep. 20 or whatever it's going to be. Um, you know, be consistent with your training. Don't have a week where you just like, uh, the, the weather's not good or whatever, or yep. I feel like going partying with my friends. So I'm going to only do one run this week and then I'll get back in my training next week. Like yep. you've got the next 10 weeks to get ready for this thing make sure you get in your four runs every week make sure you slowly build up that long run that's the most important stuff and that'll be a hell of a feeling oh it's gonna be amazing that yeah that's a huge like man and then these accomplishments i think lead to bigger things in life like it gives you right yeah more confidence it just gives you just so much different uh, outlook on things like suffering and training, commitment, discipline. And so like, sure, it's a fitness event, mm -hmm. but I think it's more like a life event. It really is. Yeah, Cause it changes right? your, it's like a mind shift you have after you've gone through something like this and not just the event itself, like not just after having been through the ultra marathon, but after having been through the, the whole block of training too, like you consistently ran four miles a week, you, you had the discipline to increase your mileage slowly week after week and be consistent. Um, you were successful at the event itself. Like, yeah. And there is like a mindset shift that happens after all this, where you take away, I don't know, something that it's like, it is like a life lesson somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, well, all it makes those you more prepared for everything in life. All those traits we just named off are really in anything you want to do. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a microcosm for life and for any challenge you come across. For sure. Yep. And I will say that planning like alternative events, like let's say you check this one off, like you could start prepping for next year's second annual or look at other things to go do. Mm -hmm. Like right now, I, I told you my five that I'm going yep, after. Yep, yep. And so like, that just gives you that vision to pursue that. Yeah. And, you know, cause I find like most people without a goal, just they're not motivated by exercise alone, right. like just exercise. Mm -hmm. It's exercise plus a goal generally is much more inspiring. And then surround yourself with cool people. Mm -hmm. Like I can't emphasize that enough. Someone just did a review on um, Dan Pena seminar in Scotland, someone I follow on Instagram. And the number one takeaway was um, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Yeah. Like so you are the average of the people you spend time with. And that is quite possibly the largest indicator of your success in life is who you're spending time Probably, with. Probably, yeah. So if yeah. you want to get in shape for a 50K or a 15K or do, you know, make healthier and choices in life. Hang out with people that are doing that. Hang out with people that are doing that. This is going to be a great day to, to go out there and meet a bunch of people that are into this kind of thing and who are doing that same thing that you're doing yeah. and that you want to get more into. Yeah, and, you, and you're right, it will inspire you to want to do more of these things down the road. So mm -hmm. it's a good first step for anybody that wants to get into this world. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I agree. Like Courtney DeWalter says, um, how far can your feet take you? Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's, it's that's a fascinating. fascinating <laughs> it yeah. It gets really exciting to, to really start to ponder that and go, I, I wonder how far I just did 50. If I do yeah. 100K, I do yeah. five, like, or I just, really did, or I just did one. I just did one or mile. Two. Can I do two? two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's wild. It's really fun. Okay, uh, sign up at co-movement.com backslash Brookfield Classic if you haven't done so already. Get it in. And um, if you don't have anything else, we're sign off. I'm good, yeah. Okay, see you folks. See you later. One last message. I ask that you please check out our show sponsors, Lombardi Chiropractic, Home Sweet Home Cleaning, Native Pass Supplements, and Thin Line Martial Arts. Their links are in the description. Not only do these companies produce outstanding products and services, but they are providing an enticing discount to all listeners who use the code COMO15. That's C-O-M-O-15 at checkout or when you give them a call.